BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And welcome to BBOR, the home of True Crime Talk Radio and your premier destination for unsolved mysteries, criminal psychology, and exploring the dark side of cyberspace. My name is Ned DeHaan, and I am your host as well as the creator of Astro Psych 400 here on YouTube, and regular contributor to the Zodiac Killer channel. And a great way to support these shows is just by listening to some more content. But you can also go over to Amazon.com and have a look at the book Killer on a White Horse, written by me, Ned Dahan. It is a novel, murder mystery, inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, but it is indeed fictional. However, who doesn't love a good mystery? And there is always the Teespring page. Feel free to check out some of the merchandise. And remember, being weird is not a crime. Let the show begin. Okay, hello everybody. Today is Monday, another Zodiac Monday. Welcome to the show. How's everybody doing? Just a couple of quick announcements and reminders before we truly begin. And the first is that I follow some YouTube channels that talk about being free speech absolutists, and they want to allow all types of discussions, but I've talked to you guys very frequently about Black Box Online Radio, and I've said that I have a lot of limits about the discussions here on this channel, particularly in the comments section. I say very openly that I'm opposed to things like bullying, harassment, or discrimination, or if people start insulting someone else's family members, those users get blocked and banned very easily. But in terms of free speech, there are different elements to it. And over the weekend, I was rather surprisingly contacted by the YouTube admins saying that there was a problem with an episode that I had done back in 2020, an episode about Jeffrey Epstein. Yes, uh, Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell. And their problem was they were accusing me of being overly sexual in an episode and possible bullying and harassment. And I couldn't believe what I was reading, simply because I made an episode where I was responding to a documentary called Filthy Rich about the story of Jeffrey Epstein, the man who was responsible for either orchestrating or managing a group of sex rings that were connected to the world's global elites. And the exact portion of the episode that stood out was, I said that there was a story called Pizzagate, where there were these accusations of how there was a sex ring that was connected to the global elites, and it was connected to the Comet Ping Pong Pizzeria, and a guy named James Alafontis. You guys know that story because that's the one that involved the radio host Alex Jones, and he had to make the public apology. And I said, with Pizzagate, there were lots of accusations. But with the story of Jeffrey Epstein, the entire world learn that these stories are true. I mean, some people have followed them very closely for years. Other people did not believe them at all. But Jeffrey Epstein had an island in the U.S. Virgin Islands called Little St. James, and it since became known as Lolita Island, where all types of people from global elite circles would go to his island, and then there would be underage women there. Perhaps the most famous person who truly got caught up in this was Prince Andrew from the royal family, who had to step down from his royal duties. But Jeffrey Epstein was also using um, these services for himself, and that was more or less done in the state of Florida. He had multiple locations around the world, and that's where Ghislaine Maxwell came into play, and that was she was his girlfriend. But primarily it seemed like they had a business relationship where she would introduce young women to him of the middle school age. And, I mean, I don't even want to get into the specifics about all of the details involving his activities with these young women. But, I mean, this isn't breaking news on Black Box Online Radio. I didn't invent that story, and I certainly didn't talk 
wasn't the first person to talk about Jeffrey Epstein's suicide. Maybe you'll remember the movement Epstein Didn't Kill Himself, where people were speculating that Jeffrey Epstein was actually murdered by the global elites so he could not talk. But I, I mean, I discussed the different interpretations of evidence on both sides of that, but just to hear that, firstly, the video was taken down because it was overly sexual and talking about bullying and harassment. Well, who on earth would it be bullying? I mean, Prince Andrew? Bill Gates, who also went to Lolita Island, bullying Jeffrey Epstein, he's dead. He committed suicide. I mean, and as you see, I do believe that Epstein committed suicide. There's a lot of evidence for that that we can discuss in other episodes if they are allowed to remain up. But just simply talking about the wrongdoings of global elites gets you in trouble with the YouTube censors is, well, it's sickening. It really is. And, I mean, YouTube is growing more and more frustrating. And to be clear, they gave me a very strong warning. They said, if this type of behavior persists, my channel will get a strike. And I was just thinking, I mean, out of all the stuff I've talked about on Black Box Online Radio, there are more than a thousand episodes of Black Box Online Radio. That's what you're zoning in on. That's what you're targeting. You're going after something that just simply is a discussion on someone else's documentary, Filthy Rich, and this is hardly an underground story that I blew wide open. I mean, every mainstream media outlet has covered the Jeffrey Epstein story, as well as talking about Ghislaine Maxwell and Prince Andrew. All of those things have been shared very publicly, but then being told that I'm getting a strong warning and if this behavior persists, my channel will get a strike... I think that that's very disappointing in terms of how YouTube is managing their content and violating their own guidelines, as well as talking about the entire concept of free speech in general. And if anybody would like to discuss this more, you can put your idea in the comments section down below. I know it's not related to the Zodiac Killer, but that's just something that happened over the weekend. Moving on to today's material. Recently on the channel, I've been talking to you guys a lot about how the Zodiac Killer may have been connected to a neo-Nazi movement. And there are going to be multiple suspects whom we can discuss in this category. The Zodiac was a serial killer who operated in California in 1968 and 69, and it's possible that the Zodiac committed additional crimes. And I've always had this big challenge question to you guys talking about how on September 27th of 1969, the Zodiac Killer committed the Lake Berryessa stabbing. It's the third crime in Zodiac um, chronology, where he targeted Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard. They were tied up and stabbed, and the Zodiac Killer was wearing this very odd black costume. Then the Zodiac returned to Brian Hartnell's car door, which was the only car in the area, um, so as I understand, and he wrote a message on the car door that had the Zodiac symbol, the word Vallejo, the dates of Zodiac activity, and the words by knife. Now, the first date that was included was 12-20-1968, or 12-20-68 to be very precise, and I do have to be precise because the numbers might actually add up to a specific meaning. 12-20-68, that was the date of the Lake Herman Road murders, which happened the previous year, although it's only about eight months or nine months before the, um, before the Lake Berryessa stabbing, excuse me. Yes, nine months if we're going from December to September. But the challenge question that I've always asked you guys is, if there were additional crimes committed by the Zodiac Killer, why didn't he write those dates on the car door at Lake Berryessa? Like, say, for example, the most frequently discussed one is the murder of Sherry Jo Bates from 1966. She was murdered on October 30th of 1966, 10 30, 66. Why not write her date of death on the car door? Or how about the Domingo Edwards murders on June 4th of 1963? Some people think that, that, was a, that the entire Lake Berryessa stabbing was a recreation of the Domingo Edwards murders from 1963. Well, why not put that date on the car door? If the Zodiac is trying to list the dates of Zodiac activity, but he's not including all the dates, and I have always asked you guys, why? To anyone who thinks that there are pre-Zodiac crimes before the Lake Herman Road murders, 
why aren't those dates listed on the corridor at Lake Berryessa? And I got a very interesting response from Wildfire99 who said, Ned, the Zodiac Killer said in a letter, I give you credit for stumbling upon my Riverside activity, but you're only getting the easy ones. There are a hell of a lot more down there. This is what some people think is the biggest connection between the Zodiac Killer and the murder of Sherry Jo Bates in 1966 because she was murdered in Riverside, California. Now, that does not give us any specific information at all about the crimes or about the killer's activity or any names or anything associated with actually committing the crimes. It's just a vague general statement. But I have to give credit to Wildfire for pointing out that the Zodiac was directly trying to say that he committed crimes outside of that list on the Lake Berryessa car door. The Zodiac was directly admitting to committing crimes before the Lake Herman Road murders. Now, did he actually do it or not? That's an entirely different discussion, and you can weigh in in the comments section down below. But I've always just asked this question. If the Zodiac committed additional homicides before becoming the quote-unquote Zodiac killer, why not take credit for it when he had a solid opportunity to do so at Lake Berryessa? And that's a pretty good response. Well, he didn't take credit for it while on the car door at Lake Berryessa. Instead, he took credit for it in a letter, which came later on. But I have also been looking at how the Zodiac Killer could have had a particular neo-Nazi connection. And this heavily connects to a Zodiac suspect that has been proposed by Sam Fisher, named Joseph Paul Franklin. But I wanted to look at a statement that was written out by Andrew Gray about a different Zodiac killer suspect, and that is Richard Gajkowski. Andrew sent this into the email address, blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. Anybody can use that email address. You can also hit the like button, subscribe, as well as visit some links in the description box, including buymeacoffee.com. Anybody who makes a donation using buymeacoffee.com will get a shout-out on Zodiac Monday. And Andrew says, Hi, Ned. Amidst the discussion of the Zodiac Killer having possible neo-Nazi ties or aspirations, I wanted to share this interesting message from 2001 on ZodiacKiller.com. In 2010, I was looking around on the archived forum for messages that evoked Richard Gajkowski, my reasoning being that Richard was something of a computer expert and was alive of the early 2000s and might ha even be tempted to join in on Zodiac Killer discussions if he was, in fact, a Zodiac. As far as Richard Gajkowski being the Zodiac Killer, as I understand, he was self-educated in computers, and he was even involved with computers in the 1980s before a lot of other people. And back to Andrew's email, I thought a, for, a former, yeah, former F-O-R-U-M-E-R, -E named Oscar, was suspicious. He appeared to be lying about his age and location, amongst other things. In one discussion thread, someone named Maxon, M-A-X-O-N, suggested that the Zodiac Killer's Lake Berryessa costume hood was similar to the KKK headgear. It's not entirely an unreasonable suggestion, in my opinion, but notice how strongly Oscar reacted to the suggestion. See below. Which popular Zodiac suspect might be easily offended by Maxon's comments? Probably the one who wrote several articles on civil rights issues when he worked in Albany, New York, and personally knew several activists in the community there. And this is a post written by Oscar, January 18th, 2001. And it says, firstly beginning with uh, Maxon, Maxon, yes, yeah, sure, Zodiac wore a KKK outfit at Lake Berryessa, which is why he was able to blend into the countryside so well. As San Francisco and the area were known for its rampant racial intolerance throughout the turbulent 60s. In fact, the Zodiac left a burning cross on Farron's front lawn. That is unconfirmed, mind you. I mean, that's my interjection. Unconfirmed. But the Vallejo police screwed the pooch on that one when the local captain took it home and used it for firewood. Darn. Paul Stein was a freedom writer, therefore he was targeted for death by an ultra-elite KKK hit squad by the Zodiac Killer, who just happened to need a cab that night after failing to find a solo Black Panther to lynch. Come on, get it to your head, and this is your friend, Oscar. P.S. Pennon, 2004, Ride the Scud. Pen is spelled P-E-N-N, -N, so I'm sure that's referring to Gareth Penn. But let's um let's look at this. Let's go through some of this here. 
Therefore, Paul Stein was targeted for death by an ultra-elite KKK squad who just happened to need a cab that night. I think that the right-wing ties connected to the Zodiac's final crime, the murder of Paul Stein, the taxi driver, stem mostly around the fact that stems from the fact that Paul Stein was Jewish, and that maybe somehow during the conversation that the Zodiac had in Paul Stein's taxi, he learned that Paul Stein was Jewish and told, was and decided to murder him for that reason. And there's actually a very interesting theory out there involving the murder of Paul Stein, where someone proposed that the Zodiac killer thought that Paul Stein resembled his appearance, that he looked very similar to him, and he murdered him in a, an act of self-hatred, and I do believe that that's a very defendable theory, but back to this whole KKK possibility, most of you are probably thinking, all right, the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan, primarily wears white hoods. Some of their high-ranking members wear other colors, most notably the red hood, which is seen very frequently, but the Zodiac Killer was wearing a black costume at Lake Berryessa, and I said this once, and I'll say it again, because the absolute closest match to the Zodiac Killer's hood at Lake Berryessa that I have seen was not the KKK hood, but the Capirote hood that are worn by the Spanish um, religious participants. And some people associate them immediately with Spanish monks, but they aren't only worn by monks, they're also worn during the festival of Holy Week. And once I saw the black ones that had been posted by a publication called El Faro, I was like, this is the closest match to the Zodiac's Lake Berryessa hood that I have ever seen. And um, the ones from Faro were in Ceuta, Spain, and then I just got on Google and the first thing that I pulled up was from Cadiz, Spain, which had the different colors of the Capirote hoods. And... Cadiz, Spain, was actually home to the largest naval base in, um, the largest Spanish-American naval base in the country, and yes, it is jointly run by the governments of Spain and America, and I'll talk to you guys a lot more about some possible Zodiac Killer naval connections, but I just think that that is a strong possibility, and that just means that it's a black hood that had a symbol in the middle that the, someone could have sewed fabric over. KKK, though, I mean, let's not even dis I'm miss the idea that the Zodiac Killer was involved with some type of neo-Nazi movement, but I'm going to take a strong stance and say I don't believe the Lake Berryessa hood was a black KKK hood. Instead, I'm still of the belief that the Zodiac Killer wore that costume because the hood already existed and he just easily modified it. And with something like a Capirote hood, he could have pulled down the pointed uh, cone-like head and tied it or sewed it onto the back because it does appear that the Zodiac Killer knew how to sew. But I'm going to go back to Andrew's email here. And this is um, by Oscar. This is another post written by Oscar. And I, if you guys aren't following along with that, I want to be very clear. It appears that Andrew is accusing this person of Oscar, Oscar of possibly being Richard Gajkowski. It is documented in Grace's book, and I have seen it mentioned multiple times in varying accounts. One of the patrolmen died a few years ago. Actually, there's a piece of preceding material that I would like to read first written by Andrew WVA. Here's another message from Oscar that appears to have a subtle and creepy confession, in my opinion. Somehow, Oscar was convinced way back in 2000 that Officer Falcon Selms actually stopped to question the Zodiac. Pay attention to the last sentence. Wow. It is documented in Graceman's book, and I have seen it in several other times in varying accounts. One of the patrolmen died a few years after the event, but the survivor admitted that the event did occur. This is in one of the accounts, it happened. Zodiac barely got away. The dispatcher had been on the ball. We may have missed the opportunity to converse on this board. I mean, P.S. Penn and Teller in 2004, ride the wave. So, um, I mean, Penn, of course, may have referred to Gareth Penn, but Penn and Teller is possibly making a mockery of that. And I think the sentence that Andrew is talking about is, Zodiac barely got away. If the dispatcher had been on the ball, we may have missed the opportunity to converse on this board. By that, I'm also talking about how the dispatcher, after the Stein murder, incorrectly stated that 
they they were they should be on the lookout for an NMA Negro male adult, and that's why a lot of people believe that the Zodiac Killer was not captured. What is this part here about how there are two police officers and one of them died in the years afterward? Well, they're talking about Donald Falk and Eric Zelms, and. I was actually reading up recently on the murder of Eric Selms, and he died in the line of duty, and that's why he's not available for a comment. He wasn't able to provide further well, contributions in any particular way about the Zodiac Killer mystery, but he didn't die years after the Paul Stein murder. No, Eric Selms actually died at the very beginning of 1970, and he died on January 1st of that year. His death was actually the first murder in San Francisco, in the Bay Area, for the year of 1970. And they are, there are lots of uh, websites that are talking about this. One of them is the Officer Down Memorial page that, um, has, that has a feature on Eric Zelms, and it says, Eric A. Zelms. Officer Eric Zelms was shot and killed by investigating a burglary on foot patrol at approximately 0200 hours. He was surprised by two burglars who attacked him and were able to gain control of his 357 caliber service revolver. The men then shot him with it and attempted to flee. The subject then encountered two other officers and exchanged shots. One of them was wounded. Both men were apprehended, convicted of the murder, and subsequently sentenced to 8 to 10 years in prison. Officer Zelms was survived by his wife and one child. I mean, you're just, um, I think eight to ten years for the murder of an officer. I was really quite surprised that that was, um, I mean, that just doesn't seem like a very strong punishment, but there are definitely different types of judges out there. There was a website called CrowdyHome.com, and that name didn't stand out to me, but I saw that it is under the title The Zodiac Manson Connection, so it appears that this was created by Howard Davis, who is the author of the book of that title, and Howard Davis, of course, has a suspect named Bruce Davis, no relation, and Bruce Davis was the right-hand man of Charles Manson in the Manson family. But this article on CrowdyHome.com, the Zodiac Manson Connection, talks more just about the activities of Eric Selms and some possible Zodiac connections to the writing. It says, Eric Selms related. Since the time the two researchers have been delving into the case, it has been hotly debated whether or not two San Francisco police officers talked to the Zodiac on the night of October 11th of 1969, after cab driver Paul Stein was murdered. Zodiac claimed, that this actually happened in his letter that was mailed on November 9th of 1969 to the San Francisco Chronicle. P.S. Two cops pulled a goof about three minutes after I left the cab. I was walking down the hill to the park when this cop car pulled up and one of them called me over and asked if I saw anyone acting suspicious or strange in the last five to ten minutes. And I said yes, there was this man running by waving a gun. And the cops peeled rubber and went around the corner as I directed them, and I disappeared into the park a block and a half away, never to be seen again. The author has always maintained that the officers Eric Selms and Officer Donald Falk did indeed speak with the Zodiac, as he claimed. Eric Selms was killed in the line of duty only a short time after the encounter. Falk, who retired, who went on to retire, was on an American television show about the Zodiac and has maintained that they were searching for a black male adult as per the All Points Bulletin that went out. I've already discussed that. And they passed a white male adult walking down the street. He said that for five to ten seconds, he took note of the person's appearance. In a memo that was dated on November 12th of 1969, after both the October 13th letter, the one that contained the piece of Paul Stein's bloody shirt, and the uh, November 9th, 1969 Zodiac letter, Officer Falk wrote this, Sir, I respectfully wish to report the following, that while responding to the area of Cherry and Washington Streets, a suspect fitting the description of the Zodiac Killer was observed by Officer Falk in an easterly direction on Jackson Street, and then north on Maple. This subject was not stopped, as the description received from communications was that of a Negro male. When the, light, when the right description had been broadcast, the reporting officer informed communications that a possible suspect had been seen going north on Maple into the Presidio, in the area of the Julius Kahn playground, and a search was started which had negative results. The suspect was observed by the officer to be 
but this is by Officer Falk, to have been a white male adult, 35 to 45 years old, about 5 feet 10 inches tall, 180 to 200 pounds, medium heavy build, barrel chested, medium complexion, light colored hair, possibly graying in the rear, may have been caused by the lighting, meaning that it's possible that the gray hair observed by Donald Falk was uh, because of the lights in the city lights, that is. Crew cut, wearing glasses, dressed in a dark blue waist-length zipper type jacket, navy or royal blue, elastic cuffs, waistband zipper, waistband zipped halfway up, brown wool pants, pleated, tight baggy in the rear, rust brown, may have been wearing low-cut shoes. Subject at no time appeared to be in a hurry while walking with a shuffling lope slightly bent forward. The subject's general appearance was Welsh ancestry. My partner that night, Officer Eric Selms, number 1348 of Richmond Station, was one. My partner was Eric Selms, excuse me. I do not know if he observed the subject or not. Respectfully submitted, Donald Falk. Okay, so, so many points are in that statement. Firstly, Falk is saying that he did not talk to the Zodiac. Secondarily, he says that he just made observations of this person's appearance. The person was not stopped because they were looking for a black man, not a white man. And this description, though, let's just say that Officer Falk did have a sighting of the Zodiac killer. I think that this is very important. Five feet ten inches tall, 35 to 45 years old, 180 to 200 pounds. I mean... This is definitely going to be somewhat on the lighter side, but a lot of people estimate that the Zodiac killer was around 200 pounds. After the Blue Rock Spring shooting, Mike Michaud stated that he thought the Zodiac was 195 to 200, which are some pretty close estimations. The footprints that were taken from Lake Berryessa when they made forensic estimations of the footprints, they estimated that the killer was 200 to 225 pounds. And this is all showing that the Zodiac killer may have actually been very close to these estimations put forward by Donald Falk, and I'm tending, I tend to think that the Zodiac Killer was bigger than 180 pounds, but that's just uh, me, and you can always weigh in in the comments section down below, but these are some very important things about the physical description, and no, Eric Selms, though, would not be able to contribute to these discussions about, I mean, it shows that Donald Falk wasn't even certain at the time of writing that if Falk had if Zelms had any involvement with this, but I'd like to get back to the post here written by Howard Davis. On the archive portion of a ZodiacKiller.com message board from the year of 2002, someone named Ray Ann asks a question. Why hasn't Eric Zelms' widow been asked if he ever talked to her about whether or not Falk and Zelms spoke to the Zodiac? Since 1987, it has been the author's desire to find either Zelms' widow or another member of the family and possibly clear up this long-lived mystery. Thankfully, during the week of August 15, 2005, I was able to interview Eric Selms' widow, Diana. The following is a brief summary of the graciously given interview. Diana said that Eric closely followed the Stein murder on television. He told her that when he and Falk saw a WMA and quickly decided to question him, he said that they spoke to this man face to face. The man was polite, calm, and answered all of their questions. There was nothing suspicious about him. They then left to continue to look for the black male adult, as had, as had been reported. I mean, this is an amazing contradiction. I mean, I mean, this is completely different than what Officer Falk wrote in that statement, just saying that the man was not stopped. And, I mean, was he simply referring to the fact that they asked him something without, like, trying to, um trying to get confrontational with him, but this is absolutely different to what was just shared by <clears throat> Officer Falk in that statement. The man was not stopped. No, the man was stopped, and he was polite, and he answered all of the questions. It would seem that Falk knew that he and Zelms had spoken to the Zodiac face-to-face, -face, and he wanted to protect a rookie officer. And that's what that, was, that is back from the post written by Howard Davis. It would be quite unthinkable that the senior officer did not know that his partner had seen the WMA, white male adult, as Falk wrote in the memo, and has said in some interviews. Zelms admitted to his wife in private that he had cooperated with Falk because he didn't want to get a negative report and possibly lose his job. In light of the heavy criticism from some quarters about the failure of the SFPD to capture the Zodiac, if what had happened were to get out, the, the effects would be devastating. 
Okay, so is this coming down to the fact that Falcon's Elms did speak to the Zodiac, and the reason why Falk is saying that in his memo is he's just trying to protect not only Zelms' reputation, but perhaps his own? I mean, is that, um, is that what this is? Trying to cover up a blunder? And I know that this is coming third hand. I mean, it's firstly, it's second hand coming from Eric Zelms' widow Diana, and then Howard Davis has interviewed her and is interpreting her comments, so it's really a third hand source. But does that not make sense to you? That Falcon's Elms did indeed speak to the Zodiac, but they, but Donald Falk provided this altered variation of the story to save face, to not, so it didn't expose the enormous blunder or it's almost a form of damage control. And um, what do you think about that? Please put your ideas in the comment section down below. And yes, rest in peace to Eric Selms. No matter what, he did not deserve to uh, die in the line of duty like that. And it appeared two people were committing a very basic burglary, and then an officer tried to stop them doing his job. And you heard the story about how they took control of his gun and fired back. But um, that was on January 1st of 1970. So um, there was actually something else that I was reading on one of the uh, memorial pages for Eric Selms. And that was that the year 1969 had twice as many murders as the um, previous uh, two years combined, meaning 67 and 68 in uh, the San Francisco area. I don't think that there's any surprise by that. I mean, I don't believe it was all the Zodiac killer. I just simply think that the reason why the Zodiac was operating in 1969 was because there was just an, a spike in criminal violence. I mean, that is just my pure take on the subject. But, um, I mean, I also thank Howard Davis for sharing this online, and thank you to uh, Diana Zelms, um, I mean, that was her name at the time, for uh, speaking publicly about this. But I'd like to move on to the next segment here on Black Box Online Radio. And this continues with the possibility of the Zodiac Killer even either being a neo-Nazi or having some type of connection to a similar movement. And I received another message from Sam Fisher, who's the author of The Zodiac Killer Identity, talking about his Zodiac suspect, Joseph Paul Franklin, whom I mentioned previously. And Joseph Paul Franklin was a serial killer known as the Racist Killer. He was very openly involved in political movements of that nature. And he says... Hi, Ned. Thanks for the discussion on Franklin. I wanted to share a few things that I've uncovered over the past two weeks. First, a picture of Franklin I thought was worth mentioning. I'll share it with you here. And for this picture, you must go to the Russian search engine Yandex to get the... The picture is not on the website listed on the Yandex search, but I wanted to copy and send it to you here. Also, I have some documents in which Franklin referred to spraying in, in reference to using a machine gun. If I remember correctly, this is from an interview he gave in the early 1980s. And the Zodiac Killer did once talk about spraying someone with bullets. You, use of the word phony in an interview he gave before execution. I can send you a link if you're interested. Yes, please do. And... He is, Sam Fisher is also saying that he's still trying to obtain some of the handwriting of his suspect, Joseph Paul Franklin, but it's become rather difficult. Some of the other evidence that he has for his suspect, Joseph Paul Franklin, are listed here as well. Ned, as I'm sure you are aware of, his name does fit into the Z18 code. Joseph Paul Franklin is 18 characters, but I also found that his, the other name that he used was James Clayton Vaughn, and this also has 18 characters as well. A variation of his name, James Vaughn Jr., is 13 characters and could fit into the Z13 cipher. Did you know that in the bomb map, if you look closely, the arrow points to a town with his middle name, Clayton it points to Clayton, California. I have a lot of notes and things that I saw that you noticed that his tattoo of an eagle is the same as on one of the stamps. And yes, that refers to um, one of the videos that Sam Fisher made about Joseph Paul Franklin. That's actually how I learned about Sam Fisher and his suspect. As I'm sure you are aware of, a good portion of the Zodiac stamps had the name Franklin on it, referring to Benjamin Franklin. I think he had the tattoos removed at some point, but we can get into that later. I believe that he had tattoos of two symbols of the 340 removed at some point, but that is a different topic for some 
on its own for another day. As you research more, the coincidences will continue to pile up for Joseph Paul Franklin. I suggest being very knowledgeable on the Zodiac Killer. You listen to the audiobook The Killer's Shadow by John Douglas. It gives you a good sense of how Franklin operates. Yeah, I would love to um, listen to that audiobook. And the other book that I really wanted to read about Joseph Paul Franklin was actually just called The Racist Killer. And, I mean, he is a Zodiac Killer suspect all the same, so I definitely want to look into him more and more. And right now I would like to get to your supporter shoutouts on buymeacoffee.com as well as the super thanks from YouTube. And firstly, we have one that comes to us from Batman66, who has just been a very reliable and and a strong supporter. Thank you so much, Batman66, as well as for all of the info that you have shared for future possible episodes of Black Box Online Radio, and a lot of it is Zodiac-related and gets worked into the Zodiac Killer News reports. And the second one comes to us from Stefan Nyberg, who says, Thanks for another great episode, Ned. I must say that I'm frankly getting fed up with the case breakers. The biggest issue with their latest claims of some anonymous FBI whistleblower informant is they... Their claim can't be validated by anyone else except themselves. Really convenient for them, right? Given their shenanigans in the past, I really can't understand how anyone can take them seriously. And that was on last week's episode where I was talking about a 20-page document and new press release that had been created by the casebreakers, those who had been pushing their Zodiac killer suspect, Gary Francis Post, and they just um, said that an FBI whistleblower informed Everyone that Gary Post had been a Zodiac suspect since 2016, and he was heavily on their radar. They also said that they were able to get to Gary Post DNA, but they were not able to get Gary Post DNA tested with anything Zodiac-related. So um, that's not a very beneficial press release, but that is um, something that's been shared all the same. Uh, Batman66 and Stefan Nyberg, thank you so much for your support. And anybody else who makes a donation or contribution to help support the show will get a shout-out on Zodiac Mondays. Now, this next thing that I'm going to share with you guys is going in a little bit of a different direction. And it's loosely Zodiac-related because a lot of you have pointed out something in the comments section. I've talked about how... There's a very high chance that the Zodiac Killer was ex-Navy. I mean, not only do we have things like the naval base at Mare Island and Vallejo, but also just the language that is used, just some of the terms that have been used, and I'll share more about this in the future, but there is the Zodiac Killer's Z-13 cipher, which was mentioned previously by Sam Fisher in this episode, one of the symbols in there resembles almost like a W, or it looks like an odd um, upside-down arch, and it's even been proposed that that could be a naval anchor, and giving a shout-out uh, to Melissa Rose, who made that observation, and she has, she does have a solution to the Z-13 cipher, but I'm still uh, going through her observations. But one thing that I saw about um, the Zodiac and the Navy that from you guys in the comments section was that the term Zodiac, the name Zodiac, is used for a type of boat. And I was watching the film 2010 Moby Dick, or I think Moby Dick 2010 is the actual name in that order, and um, it's a retelling of the story of Moby Dick, and it was meant to be in the contemporary times, contemporary to 2010, and at the end of it, um, they're on this submarine, actually, again, contemporary, and then they decide to start hunting Moby Dick in the Zodiacs, and very frequently they're talking about the word Zodiac, and let's just get to um the issue with that. What is a Zodiac on a type, on a ship? The, the Zodiac is an indispensable inflatable boat used to transport passengers on excursions away from a cruise ship, and I mean, it is the inflatable boat, I mean, like, I, I'm so tempted to uh, use some, some other boat terminology that I think is going to misrepresent that. But if you have, you, you've seen these things before. Everyone has. It has the inflatable, almost horseshoe-like ring that goes around. I say horseshoe because it's a ring that but only on three sides, more or less. And the Zodiac boat gets its name from Zodiac Airships and Aviation. And it was actually named for a Zodiac... Uh, for, it was named for a French company called Zodiac that specialized in the production of airships. In the 1930s, Pierre de Brutel was one of its engineers, 
and he invented the first prototype of the inflatable boats for the Aeronaval, which I guess is the French uh, Navy. And, I mean, there are just countless clues that suggest the Zodiac Killer was ex-Navy. I've even talked about some of them here in this episode, such as there's the naval base in Cadiz, Spain, and I don't know why I have such a fascination with that. When I learned about the copper rote hoods, and I was thinking, is it just possible that the Zodiac Killer obtained one of these copper rote hoods in Cadiz, Spain, because he was in the Navy, and he is just surrounded by all of these things that are Zodiac-related, such as the Zodiac boats, and so on, as well as um, just the entire concept of being familiar with zodiac signs in terms of celestial navigation that has been talked a lot by about by Michael Cole and Drew Beeson, and that is something that would be would have been learned in the Navy or the Air Force. But of course, navigation coming from the Navy, and I mean, the Zodiac may have been someone who was ex-military, who um you could have learned about codes in the Navy. And I think that there are a lot of possibilities that are piling up. But if you ever do watch the film 2010 Moby Dick, it is a very um, odd retelling because it's one of those movies where they use a lot of low-budget special effects. And if they had just left those out, it would have been such a better film. And we're talking like piss-poor sci-fi channel-style special effects. And the... um. The attempts to hunt Moby Dick and the Zodiacs were not very, um, very successful, but in this movie, Barry Bostwick plays Captain Ahab, and I can't think about Barry Bostwick in anything other than the Rocky Horror Picture Show and Pepsi commercials, and I thought he was an odd choice to play Captain Ahab, but he did a rather convincing job of it, and I really liked how the film captured his descent into madness, and he has this obsession with hunting a white whale. And there is even this scene where they, they take the Zodiacs to just an island, just like a little atoll that is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And there's this graveyard. And then the, Bar Barry Boswick playing Captain Ahab is telling the story of how there was this priest in the 1800s who was buried here. And he's showing that he actually is someone who is smart and intelligent and knowledgeable and worldly. And then he takes the wooden cross that was used for the grave of the priest and then he just destroys it to make a peg leg for himself so he can continue to hunt Moby Dick because his prosthetic leg had been destroyed. In the search, as I said, it's 2010. It was an attempt to be contemporary, and it's just about the descent into madness and how someone just has this obsession. And even knowing that once the obsession is actually achieved, like hypothetically, if Captain Ahab were able to kill Moby Dick, he wouldn't gain anything from that. He is mad at Moby Dick because Moby Dick um, caused him to lose his leg, as well as just the entire concept of revenge or how about powerlessness, not being able to conquer a foe, but he doesn't benefit from that, he doesn't gain anything. Revenge is illogical in many ways, because people don't obtain things from it, they just do this because they want to have power over somebody else, and a lot of the activities of the Zodiac Killer in the 1960s fall into that category. The Zodiac is not achieving anything other than feeling a certain way about himself. The creations of the letters and the ciphers, it is really something that could have put him in jail for the rest of his life, put him in on death row. And I don't even think those are like outrageous things. This person is doing it to fuel his own excitement. He's doing this for his feelings. He's not trying to accomplish anything that we know of, that we know of. Now, some people have Zodiac Killer theories out there saying that, oh, Darlene Verdon was the prime target, or that Paul Stein was the prime target, and that these were a series of unrelated murders that were committed to cover it up. Okay, and those theories, there actually would be an objective that the person is trying to achieve and accomplish, and they are trying to um, do something specific other than their own emotions. But that, those are purely theoretical statements. I mean, I have not seen anything convincing that would suggest that Darlene Farron was the prime target in the Zodiac Killer mystery, or that Paul Stein was the prime target and the unrelated murders were committed. I mean, I simply just think that um, 
those are possibilities that should be entertained. But as far as the name Zodiac goes, I am someone who believes that the Zodiac Killer did read the story Signs E by Edwin Baird. Yeah, I believe that the Zodiac did watch the film Charlie Chan at Treasure Island, which could have been the choice for the word Zodiac. But, I mean, what I wanted to share about this thing with the Zodiac boats is that it shows exposure to this particular word where someone would be thinking about, oh, I like the name Zodiac. It has um, something that would have just stayed in his mind for a very long time, not to mention the Zodiac watches, Ford Zodiac, and um, the Zodiac symbol is used on the Zodiac killer, on the Zodiac watches. The Zodiac killer symbol is used on the Zodiac watches. So all of that shows that um, there are numerous influences about how this person could could have and most likely was exposed to these uh, sources and I mean was the Zodiac Killer actually dealing with Zodiac boats in the Navy I don't know but I think that there's a very high possibility and this word is always staying in his mind and he has this fascination with the word Zodiac he thinks it's a cool sounding word initially I do believe that the Zodiac Killer wanted to be the serial killer Z I believe that the letter C was chosen first and the additional letters were added on later but that's just uh, my take on the subject. And one more time, if you would like to watch the movie uh, 2010 Moby Dick, it is available here on YouTube for free. I saw it on the Popcorn Flicks channel. And, I mean, I always like liter literature on film and updated versions of these stories. So, um, if anyone wants to watch that, that one, that is available for free. And anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box. And there was always blackboxned88 over on Instagram. And I will see you there for the bonus podcast. Goodbye.